so, of course, the implication of this I drew years ago, lots of people simply hated it, tough beans. Uh, the uh, farewell to the median voter, the median voter is that 51st voter on a, a hundred of them, uh, the, where everything is said to converge. This, this, is, this leads to what I just call the, sometimes the pillars of Hercules principle or the principle of non-competition among all investors, meaning if they all agree there's no competition and they agree on a lot of things like a lot of property rights and so forth. Only positions that can be financed can be maintained. That also applies to political language, so there's more variance in that because there isn't any way you can sort of quite supervise that. The problem in modern political analysis is really analyzing investor blocks. And so the problem is, how do you do that? Well, uh, it's not surprising that you probably don't have a great idea. Hardly anyone else does it. Um, and so, like, let me just look at a quick. Uh, very, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, Paul Jorgensen and Ji Chen, have for the last few years been doing eh, medium data. I'm not calling it big data. Real big data is a lot bigger than what we deal with. I mean, we have a mere five million records or something in there. We, 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 you have to take the IRS database with the FEC database, Federal Election Commission, the, uh, the IRS because they do so-called 527 money, which almost always comes in below the radar. You have to merge those databases, then you gotta run the equivalent of programs that hospitals do when they buy a hospital chain uh, and find out how many patients they've got. And we wrote a lot of those. So, uh, I mean, that is to say, we take, we take canned programs and then rewrite them. Um, and what, what we do, therefore, is we can actually sort through who are all these folks. Uh, I just don't hold me to these numbers, but it's something like this, a nice example. We, what we always find is that there are many more people contributing larger sums than everybody else. Why do we find that? Because we're the only ones who look to see whether they might, because if, if you ever look at this data, it's like amazing. I have done it for years. In the old days, I did it by hand. Uh, that is why my hair turned gray. Um, the, uh, uh, like for example, you'd get eh, Bill G. Smith, B. G. Smith, uh, B. G. Smith Sr., uh, B. G. Smith Sr. with four addresses different, and they're really all the same person. I mean, we linked up a lot of people by simply uh, computerizing a search for, okay, who's in New York and who's in Florida in the winter? Do they have the same name? That, then we could do a visual thing and guess what we found. You know, you know as well as I do what we found is, particularly with the folks we're concentrating on, uh, <clears throat> there were lots and lots of people who were really the same givers. The, it's a standard uh, ways of doing this. The standard political science methods, folks, even at UCLA, who claim to sort of do, they don't do this stuff. So, I mean, this, this is a case where if you believe anybody's numbers but ours, you're out of your mind. But on the other hand, this is, I, you know, I, I understand where I am and when I am and so forth. So, now, this is out of a, a discussion of 2012. This is from a paper in the International Journal of Political Economy that we did, walked you through it. The thing you want to look at here, I think, is pretty interesting. Look at Obama and Romney, the unitemized, that's the small money. I mean, theoretically, if you give less than that, if you give more than that, even, and you do two contributions, you're supposed to report. Now, they probably don't. We are maybe now able to check that uh, for 2016, but because uh, of the way this stuff is being reported. But what you see there is there is still a difference between the major parties. Now, Democrats still collect more money from small givers than the Republicans do. Um, then look at... Um, uh, depending on how, whose estimate you think. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, uh, our paper gives, gives you a range. I would say if you're contributing more than a grand in a presidential election, you probably belong to the 1%. I mean, if you feel a different, that's fine. I mean, the, the, what this empirically comes down to, it depends on the year. Uh, maybe uh, back in 2010, might have been 350,000 a year. Uh, probably 700,000, maybe not. Uh, never mind. Point is, just do these sums and you can see that both major parties are hugely dependent on l very large contributions. Uh, okay, I mean, if you simply sum 15, 21, and 30, uh, you get, you know, there, you won't find much of a difference. Now, let me. Yes. Now, then this is the sort of steps that my, I, I have been doing for ages. My colleagues help me with now. Um, you, what you really want to do is just junk all this stuff 
Because, I mean, the problem, I mean, look, in some political systems, you really have class-based politics where they come out uh, with a party. For a while, the Swedish party, for example, that was the business party, actually, I think, called itself the bourgeois party. That made it pretty easy to understand what was going on in front of you. I mean, there is actually a great book on this question where they take the same questions uh, to a Swedish audience and an American audience. And, you know, the Swedes can place all the parties and the candidates they know left to right. I mean, all this stuff that is said to be beyond the cognitive capacity of American voters, they can do. Um, the, uh, or did, we'll get to that argument another day. Um, the, um, in the U.S., you get enormous differences on who, where candidates are, uh, who, wh uh, what, where the parties are. I mean, it's like a huge cloud. Uh, the conclusion that uh, Burnham and I and a few other people drew was, you know, the, this is fundamentally about the information system in the system. It's not basically about anybody's cognitive capacities or whatever. And ever, all of the stuff you were hearing today about, yeah, people way underestimate the percentage of cash um, at large, uh, that, pardon me, that top execs make is correct. It sure is. Though uh, at INET, we have some research by Bill Lozanic. Lozanic is going to show you shortly that the standard estimates of that are way off, that even the Black-Scholes formulas for valuing options since about 2006 have actually been uh, way off. Anyway, all right, so um, the first step in the type of stuff I like to do and have been doing for 35 years to eh, pretty much a lot of abuse in political science, but I mean, look, big audience around the world. Uh, is you walk through, uh, especially how, what's the differences among big business? That's the number I think to watch. That was the difference that we got in 2012. Now go on, and then you look, uh, rarely do you see pure intersectoral stories, but the intersectoral stories um, in campaigns from the New Deal forward uh, are very, very important. They are also plain as day. You have to be an idiot not to see them if you start looking. Um, and, uh, you know, the problem is nobody does, and you get all these crazy views like the Republicans are the party of big business, the Democrats are the party of, never quite clear, unions or something like that. You know, what would that make them now? The party of about 7% of <laughs> American workers or something like that. Uh, and they don't tell you that, you know, the White House tells labor leaders, if you'll cooperate with us, we'll put you on boards and things like that. Um, anyway, um, on this one, you can read, uh, I, don't, I don't have time. If you look at just a couple of points, look at those early sectors, coal, mining, paper, chemicals, those are hugely Republican. They're, they are, of course, disgusting polluters. Um, if you look at uh, the web and software at the time, and a point we noticed in our piece a lot, precisely the people who were often said to be uh, part of the uh, surveillance thing, uh, Obama was actually, oh, Silicon Valley is where Obama pulls out as an absolute majority uh, among big business. Um, now, um, uh, now, the other implication of this type of analysis is you want to pay attention to merger movements because they reshape the business community, and so they reshape all those patterns of giving. Um, this is a bad diagram. It's just the only one I could find. It doesn't show the latest wave of merger movements. Uh, not too surprisingly, uh, right up to 2007, you were emerging like crazy. Then they stop for a little bit. Then they resume again. Uh, now, if you know, if you care to see 1896, the Great Depression, uh, and somewhere in the late 60s as all marking political realignments, I have a paper that you might want to read. Um, and I have done a statistical analysis of the voting stuff. I can tell you that the claims made by a lot of political scientists that you can't use, can't get, you know, decent time series on, they're just wrong. They just, you know, there's just no... No, it's not a, it's, it, it is rocket science, so you can have a sort of dispute about it. Uh, but that's for another day. Um, very quickly, though, this is the point I want to sort of quickly bring home. I heard for years that, uh, oh, no, money couldn't be driving. Uh, we knew that money could not possibly be driving congressional elections. And I thought to myself, why doesn't somebody test this? When my colleagues and I were putting together both the outside money uh, that is to say the non-campaign -com committee money and the uh, inside money, we actually had, you know, for the first time, something like true money uh, um, models here. So we scatter plot at them, and voila, you get this. Um, and uh, now here's the thing. It, the, um, 
There's a lot of ways you can deal with this. I will simply ask you to believe right now, we have actually run this back to all the years for which there is data. Every election looks like that. Every House election shows you that pattern. Every Senate election shows you that pattern. Though the, look, with, with 30, anywhere from 32 to 34 cases in the Senate, you will find a much more variable um, uh, pattern than you will in 420 some. We toss the ones where there are a couple states where you have these weird runoffs. Uh, so we end up with a battle, 428K, each one. Bottom line on this stuff is, uh, no, they've all been like this. Now, you, the sophisticated response, Can you say what that means? it means that basically the, what you could call it is the per democratic percentage of money predicts the democratic percentage of the vote. Well, what, what, a crude way of putting this is the linear model. Um, now, you can also play games with junking both ends. Um, and just get, because those are where, where there's no opponent, then you pile up at that end. If you're interested in residuals, we can go on about this forever. You get amazing residual plots, though, when you actually start uh, to look at this. Um, and now, let me come quickly to the, what some people are saying. This was the response I got. Well, I mean, this is pretty much, no, we're sort of at Fort Apache here, about to go down. I mean, uh, two generations of political science should have noticed this pattern. They didn't. Uh, but then the last response was, well, it must be really being driven by another variable uh, that you can't measure. Uh, uh, I, gotta admit, I have to admit yeah. stupidity. What you said to Aaron didn't. All right, look. Can I move? I cannot. You put me in this thing. Here, you can do this. Look, just as the democratic percentage of cash. What does it mean, democratic percentage? It means you take the total money in the election. How much of it went to the Democrat? How much of it went to the Republican? Okay? In other words, and then just follow that. As, you, as that percentage goes up, the way that business is the Democratic margin, I'm going to ask you to believe what that means is that the Democrat is getting more and more votes. And it's getting it in an unreal straight line that should not exist. This is the type of stuff they say, well, of course, this, you only find this stuff in laboratory. You don't find this in reality. Nah, it's, it's what you get uh, here. And anyway, let me come back down because the, 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 so the argument is, well, you must have uh, endogeneity in here. What do you do with it? Typically, what you need for that is a latent variable. Uh, so my colleagues and I read a Dutch uh, statistics thesis. And we said we can actually, the usual, if you, the usual problem with latent variables is they're awful. Um, and they sort of end up being, well, you can't think of any reason not to use them. I don't like that. Particularly when you ask political scientists about money and politics, uh, don't leave it up to their judgment whether they can think it's a good variable or not. So we do, a, a, in a paper we will uh, publish shortly, uh, we do a latent instrumental variable, a spatial one. That's the only type of it. There's no other model of this in the whole world like that. And what we show you is uh, if you make a reasonable correction for endogeneity, you still get this outcome. In fact, the R squareds go up. Uh, and I, I have another direct test, which is too cute for uh, a short discussion. Anyway, so here's my point. How does money matter in 2016 election? In other words, after this enormous windup, we finally arrived to the pitch uh, that we're here to talk about. Um, and the answer is, look, when you hear the Wall Street Journal telling you uh, that uh, money didn't matter, see George Bush, nah, presidential elections are one-offs. I mean, you get just three, four candidates. If you start rolling three or four things of dice, you're going to get some weird results once in a while. Uh, the story on Trump is, I do not disagree with any of the stuff. Yeah, he was a TV star. Yes, he understood media, but he also had a billion dollars. He didn't need money from anybody. Uh, and that's, he could just go out there and laugh, for instance, at Scott Walker. Now, you've got to admit, whatever else you think about Trump, what should Scott Walker go down? Who was, after all, he wasn't the formal candidate of the Cooks, but he was said to be often one of their favorites. That was truly amusing, right? I mean, you know, the, uh, similarly with Marco Rubio and some of these other people, um, how can he do this? Well, he's the only candidate that doesn't need their cash. You know, I mean, this is, it's sort of a funny fantasy foretaste of what you could do with an election where money didn't matter, where you had public financing uh, or something like that. 
The other thing is, is on Sanders, uh, I think Sanders does it the old-fashioned way, smaller contributions. I haven't been able to run my uh, hour, because it's not me, it's my two colleagues too, Ji Chen and Paul Jorgensen, um, our schemes for amalgamating contributions, but I am pretty sure Sanders is not sitting there with really large contributions when you add them up. I mean, the Obama campaign in 2008 and then a bit in 2012, though less, actually encouraged people to give in small groups. And then, I mean, they actually did it. I even saw one email uh, on this point. Um, the point, uh, so where is Clinton coming from? Look, she was and remains a new Democrat. Um, if you look carefully at, which you could hardly do, at that table I had in 2012, you could see the divorce, partial divorce between uh, Wall Street and the Democrats. It was over the Volcker rule, over Dodd-Frank, uh, and a, a lot of those folks, though there was still a fair amount of uh, Wall Street money into Obama, it wasn't like what it was in 2008 or in years before uh, there. Uh, the, you all know about the famous, what is it, 658,000, whatever it was that the Goldman gave her before she declared. Uh, I will tell you right now, uh, just like I said before Obama got the nomination that, you know, you're not going to see serious financial reform out of a uh, Clinton administration. You will not see it out of a Clinton administration. This is not, I mean, Gary Gensler <coughs> is a serious reformer. He is uh, in her thing, but my reading is that Gensler is like Robert Reich was in the Clinton 1996-1992. Uh, that is to say, he's the symbol you point to to say, we're, well, we really hear you. Well, no, they don't. Um, <coughs> so where does this leave us uh, here? And now, <coughs> I have to say, I tend to see this from a very different perspective. I've done a lot of work on German history. I've worked in the archives a lot. Um, I said when Henry Turner's book came out that it was nonsense, that big German big business did not. In 2008, Joachim Folt and I published a piece in the Quarterly Journal of Economics that has pretty, it's become about the most cited, one of the most cited pieces around. We show you that, but what I like to call, I mean, I, my, everybody else can put their, the classical uh, Nuremberg coalition, heavy industry, IG Farben, machine tools and so forth, yeah, they were linked to Hitler rising and that's that. And I have looked at an infinite number of archives in Germany and I, not more recently under INET, uh, these folks, uh, Tiziana Foresti, Nadia Garbellini, and Ariel Vinkierman have been look, doing the same type of um, stock market approach. This is um, event analysis uh, where you compare stocks in public. You can, I mean, it may sound crazy, and particularly the first time you see it, you, can, you, you hear it, you can't believe it, but it's been done repeatedly. Um, I remember when I saw this done for the first time, my colleague at the University of Texas uh, he had a little great little paper he was trying to do called Death of a Congressman. Um, and what he, uh, what he was able to show you is that if somebody dies unexpectedly, their stocks fall that afternoon that they're close to. Um, and you can take that through. And we now have a paper getting about to come out on Mussolini. I will not break the suspense. You can find out later. Uh, how that works. My take, though, is that when you look at this stuff, uh, you can see particularly, especially in Peter Langer's book, which seems completely unknown here in English. I mean, it's a, it's a book in German. Uh, the, uh, there are all kinds of discussions and signs and going forth between uh, Hitler and the big businesses in the months before the uh, actual naming of him to chancellorship. Um, and you know, if you're familiar with that stuff, you want to ask, what's, what does the Trump stuff look like? Mostly, it seems to me, it's probably not happening, though we all see this through a glass darkly. We cannot tell, and they are not going to report in the papers uh, a lot of this, though I think it will be. I, I don't see at this moment the kind of accommodation process that you could trace in the German business community between about March of 32 in January and really March of 33. I'm not seeing that with Trump, at least not yet. If you look at the neoconservative uh, discussions and their financial backers, um, what I think you see is you could see Hillary Clinton openly signaling them about eight or nine months ago that, uh, you know, you could come here, and uh, particularly on China policy, we can talk about if you're interested later, um, and 
Um, now many of them are in fact saying we can't live with all this stuff about NATO uh, and uh, free trade, the other holy of holy stuff, though if you actually look at what Trump said on NATO, I read that thing very, he basically wants what you could call the Republican Party user charges uh, to sort of go up. Um, and uh, the big problem where we are coming here is, is this, is that you can see this happening, right? There's all this discussion of high anxiety and economic crisis. Nothing, if, if you get Clinton versus anybody but uh, Trump, nobody is even going to try to address that. I will take it for granted that Paul Ryan, who I notice one of the Cox is alleged to have said should be the nominee. That's why we may, this may not be over uh, quite yet. Um, or uh, if Sanders goes down, which you know is likely but not certain, uh, you could be right back. You're going to have two nominees who have basically not talked into those problems at all. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I, I, I want to sort of repeat my point. It doesn't matter how many people are out there uh, shake, shaking, rattling, and rolling. Uh, the, uh, without some way to finance candidacies, you won't see candidates coming forward to address that. The Republican Party can drop right back into that kind of fitful stupor where all the candidates in the room just sit there talking forever about uh, you know, a stronger military, cutting social expenditure, cutting taxes some more. You can go right back to that. Uh, this is a story of money in politics. All of the stuff my two colleagues over there said, which I, I really liked, I appreciated. That's much less crazy than most of the stuff I've heard. Uh, though I would warn you against a conclusion put out by folks at UCLA where they claim the Tea Party was being financed by Forbes fortune, as opposed to corporate America. My colleagues and I worked through this in detail. This paper is coming out. Uh, we find that your chances of getting money from the mainstream corporate America are about twice that of getting it from a Forbes in the Tea Party candidates, if you take that caucus. I mean, that's, that's a testable uh, hypothesis. Anyway, uh, we will, you know, you could, you could basically, what if they give an election and uh, nobody talks about anything that interests anybody? You may be on the edge of big collapse and turnout. We will all find out. Um, so, you know, if you, if you, as I often end the discussions, uh, if you, um, if you want a happy ending, see a Disney movie. <laughs> okay. This is not, I mean, then Tim Burton went to work for Disney, which sort of screwed that up. Anyway, that's my talk. Uh, so thank you for listening.